<laughs> Hello everyone. Hello and welcome to AIDS Map Live's Valentine special, HIV, sex and relationships. I'm here with an absolutely incredible audience. I'm going to introduce to you now. First of all, we have Thomas Hayes, who is an advocate and activist wearing Saving Lives t-shirt. Thank you. That reminds me that you're uh, a trustee of Saving Lives charity. Is that right? Yes. Tom is on TV and in the newspapers all the time. But I saw you in the paper the other day and um, you didn't tell everyone about that. What exactly were you doing, Tom? Um, it was the annual No Trousers Tube Ride event, which is uh, organised by the Stiff Upper Lip Society. It's like a day of silliness around London. One of them is a tube ride with no trousers. Excellent. And did you have on your, your special pants? Of course. Excellent. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, <laughs> Next, we have Dr. Naomi Sutton from Rotherham Hospital, who's also the E4 Sex Clinic Television Doctor. Naomi, I and also you're to do with Saving Lives as yeah, well. Yeah, newly appointed trustee. But no T-shirt yet. I've got my bands on. Oh, okay, well that's that's all right. Like, hello, Dr. Steve Taylor from <laughs> Save, Saving Lives, <laughs> by the way. Na uh, Naomi, so I was actually like doing a bit of research about you in the Huffington Post, and mm -hmm. I saw a quite an interesting story that you shared to the Huffington Post about unusual things that have happened to you in your practice. Do you care to share it with the audience and everyone on the internet? <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, obviously we examine lots of penises and vulvas and vaginas yes. and so erections aren't uncommon yes. because of embarrassment. But this particular event was just the next stage on from an erection and he ejaculated <laughs> all over my hands. <laughs> <laughs> Quite Excellent. suddenly, yeah, it was quite sudden, and he thought he was weeing. Okay. And then it all just came out. I'm not sure who was most shocked, me Wonderful. or him. Wonderful. Did you have your hair tied back? <laughs> <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> Excellent. <laughs> well, well, that's uh, that's a relief. Yes. Thank, thank yes. you for but sharing very that. Unusual, and that. you know, it's nothing to be embarrassed about. Wonderful. So, if anyone has that issue, Naomi is. <laughs> <laughs> Come to, <laughs> Come to Rotherham. Come to Rotherham. Next, we have Doc, Dr. Matthew Page, also Saving Lives charity. Yes, I am, and I'm wearing my wristbands before Dr. Taylor. Yeah. But no t shirt. No you're, t shirt. You're letting, you're letting the side he, down. he asked me, but I was already on my way down, uh -huh. so. Oh, oh dear, he's not going to be happy. No, we won't. I apologise uh, sincerely. <laughs> but you're a sexual health and HIV doctor at Birmingham Hospitals. That's correct, is, yeah. Is that, that's right. And also, you are involved in lots of medical associations with loads of acronyms like yeah. BASH and Beaver, which Bash seems appropriate Beaver, yes. for uh, <laughs> this. But even though that you're really passionate about sexual health, that's not your real um, passion, is it? No, you I have to share what, well, what you really love. I, I really do love Beyonce. Uh, yeah. it's, people that know me know it's no secret. Yeah. Um, at work, they got me a mug that says, what would Beyonce do? Excellent. And I often go to that when I'm trying to, trying to figure out what I'm doing. It's like, what would Beyonce do in this situation? And that seems to have Sound kept advice. me in, yeah, kept me in good stead. Do you do that with your medical practice? Uh, don't it's, go to hospital in it's Birmingham. It's a way of life. <laughs> Tr trust me, trust me, it's the way to go. Okay, fantastic, thank you. Next we have Jason Domino, renowned uh, activist, um, porn actor, um, sex worker, founder, and director of the Domino Foundation who have wonderful initiatives like Porn for Prep. Uh, but Absolutely. Jason, <laughs> you peddle porn in a different way uh, for charity. Uh, Would you like to share? So for World AIDS Day uh, just come, yes. uh, I was with a group of uh, porn performers cycling about 26 miles around London. Wonderful. Um, which was, we sort of ran in parallel to the, the Red Run, yes. uh, raising some money for HIV charities. And I didn't have my bike ready in time, so I did the whole thing on a Santander cycle. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> which is not fun. <laughs> well, that, that's dedication. Thank you. And finally, we have Rebecca Mbue, who every AIDS Map Live, 
I ask patients, I ask panelists for just a sentence I could talk about, and there's always someone that goes a little bit further. Rebecca, I would say, has given like two pages <gasps> this time of stuff about you. Let's see what I can remember. So you're an advocate, a women's advocate, uh, activist, um, Salamander Trust. It's a charity that you're yeah. involved with. Would you like to expand? You've been living with HIV for 23 years uh -huh. and have been active in the sector all that time? Yeah. Um, on and off, formally, much later on in the years. Yeah. Also fantastic. But the last time I saw you on stage, you were with this London guy. Would you like to share who that was? Um, my claim to fame, really. Yes. I was introducing the Mayor of London on the Fast Track Cities. Uh, which was an immense pleasure. Fantastic. Did you mm. do like selfies with him? Uh, a few. A few. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Wonderful. Well, thank you ever so much, everyone. We have a, a live studio audience here. We have James and Ant, who are going to be taking your questions on Facebook and Twitter. So please, guys, get your questions over to them. We will try really hard to answer as many as we can. Mm -hmm. And also, I know Positively UK's women's room are having a watch party <laughs> at the minute. Does everyone like to say hi, yeah. ladies? Yeah. Hello, you are with us in spirit. So I know I've got a question um, from you that I will be asking as well. But um, if we can start off with some other questions that people have asked. So, so Tom, as someone who's been living with HIV for eight, eight, years, eight years, how did um, your HIV diagnosis actually affect your sex life and, and relationships? It's a big question, isn't it? Yes. Um, so when I was diagnosed back in August 2011, I didn't want to have sex ever again, I don't think. I, I associated sex with HIV, associated HIV with probably dying because I didn't know anything about HIV at the time. So in that, my head, that meant no more sex ever again. Mm -hmm. It took me a good maybe year and a half, two years before I was ready to have sex. Right. Um, I think which is quite common people living with HIV, they kind of swear off sex for a while until they're, they're feeling themselves again. Mm -hmm. So I went back in, I started dating somebody, but unfortunately they were, they were HIV negative. Um, I didn't know about you cause you at the time. Right. Um, and they were pressuring me to have sex without a condom, which made me feel uncomfortable. So broke up and then I didn't have sex again for another sort of six months okay. of that. But now I've got, an amazing sex life. I've got a wonderful fiance who's also positive and undetectable like myself. And yes, my sex life has never been better, but it's taken me a good while to get there since my diagnosis to build up my, my confidence again. Okay, brilliant. And, and, and Rebecca, would you say as a, as a woman living with HIV, how has HIV affected how, how you feel about sex and relationships? Um, I mean, a bit like Tom, it's, it's pretty accurate. The first sort of few years, um, you go completely off sex so you, you you know everything just sort of sh shuts down uh, when I was diagnosed I was in a relationship I was actually married at the time so you know my my thoughts weren't exactly around that but um, after many years I lost my husband and then that in itself meant sex was off the table for quite a while uh, but then as you know you you get a lot more confident about talking about sex and going back out into the field and your perceptions change a little bit. The more you get comfortable with your own self, the more confident you are to talk about sex. Mm -hmm. mm. So how important has the you equals you message for, for, for people that don't know that undetectable equals untransmittable? Has that been important for you? Um, it has. It's sort of enhanced my confidence around negotiating sex. I mean, it's taken me a lot of years to get to the point where I am, where I can talk about sex quite candidly with whoever it is that I'm, you know, entering into a relationship with. But with the you equals you message, that sort of made it um, more valid. It's not just my word, it's actually science backing it. So that's really important and it's made it much, much easier. And, and has, um, the you equal to you message, is that something that, that, that the, the doctors, that you discuss with your patients? Definitely. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. definitely. I think it's the, I think it's one of the most powerful messages we've had since treatment, really. I think treatment in the late 90s was amazing. And then this has been it's just another step. And I just think it helps. Uh, it's interesting to listen to Bex and um, Tom that it's, 
a lot about how you feel in yourself. And so part of it is understanding your own condition enough to, I guess, destigmatize yourself about the condition. Because mm. I think when you're diagnosed, as Tom said, I'm going to die, and you know, there's lots of misconceptions out in the general public. Um, I think it's a shame that we haven't had more campaigns about the U equals U, because I still think it's limited to small groups like people who come here and watch people like that. I do lots of GP training communities, and you know, lots of people have still not heard of this. Can you and explain so it for people that might not actually know what so, that means? Yeah, so if someone, so when uh, someone living with HIV on treatment, um, if it's effective treatment, which you know 99.9% .9 of the time it is, if you take it, your viral load will be undetectable. So when we take a blood test, we can't detect the virus in the blood. And we know this, I mean, Matt will give you the figures, he's better with his brain, <laughs> but you know, there's literally thousands and thousands and thousands of sex acts in all these big studies where there's been no transmissions. So actually, I always tell people, someone diagnosed with HIV on treatment is actually safer to have sex with than someone who doesn't know the status and has never been tested because, you know, we know that you have HIV, you're undetectable, you can't then transmit it. Mm -hmm. okay. Are you going to do the maths, Matt? Um, yeah, <laughs> tell us the stats, Matt. <laughs> well, no pressure. pressure. Um, like you said, there's been, there's been absolutely loads of studies and they've looked at not just thousands, tens of thousands of sex acts among heterosexuals and homosexuals as well. And there's zero linked HIV transmissions between an HIV positive person suppressed on treatment and an HIV negative person. And I think that's incredible. And mm. to a point where a lot of patients don't believe me when I just mm -hmm. say you equals you. And I find uh, Dr. Taylor has made this beautiful um, sort of A5 poster, it's a little shout out there, with all the trials <laughs> that list yeah. that have proven that. And then only when they see the data, they're like, oh wow, actually you're not just saying it to make me feel better. There's actual truth behind it. And also, I, think, I think we've been fairly slow to get on the bandwagon because yeah. it was only last year that Beaver made a statement to say there is no risk because there was this kind of negligible risk or whatever. So as a doctor telling a patient, like, mm, there might be a bit of a risk, that's really difficult then to, well, do I not use a condom or do I use a condom? So I think we've been quite slow almost to take it up. Yeah. I think now it's easy, there's no, no risk. risk. Okay. And that's really key. And, and Jason, uh, has the U equals U message, how important is that in, in sex work? And it's a really interesting one because I would say it's not just trials that people are looking at. Also, there was the Swedish statement 2008, which looked at historic patients. Mm. And the fact that there hasn't been a, a transmission from someone who's living with HIV, at actual patients, people who've been like historically living with HIV, yes. just adds that extra level of people saying, okay, well, this is ongoing data. People are going to keep looking at this and we're part of something really solid. But when it comes to uh, sex work, when it comes to porn, getting someone convinced that an undetectable performer is the safest performer to be on set mm -hmm. has been a bit of a challenge. It's uh, your, your people come from many different countries and there's yeah. a lot of different information pools. Uh, OK, thank you. And, and Tom, you, you do a lot in terms of spreading the you equals you message mm. around. I mean, has that been something important to you? Yeah, as Matthew and Naomi said, uh, I do a lot of sort of one-on-one -on -one online uh, peer support with people and just the the realisation on their faces when they you tell them that they are no longer infectious. A lot of people have been living with HIV in the UK, let alone worldwide, have been told they're undetectable, but no one explains what that means to them. Doctors go, congratulations, you're undetectable. And then they go away and they may have been undetectable for 10, 20 years and no one's explained that, you know, in the last decade or so we've realised that if you're undetectable you don't pass on HIV yeah. to your sexual partners and the weight that's lifted off their shoulders, the, the, um, the fear of passing it on to somebody you love is completely removed and oh. it's just very freeing. Wonderful. And Re Rebecca, do you, do you talk about the you equals you message um, with partners um, and in your work? Both, yes. I do. Um, what, what I tend to do, or what I you know, prefer to do, is always have the initial conversation. Um, but I've also got this thing where I, I don't become the teacher if it's within a relationship setting. Mm -hmm. So I'll then you know, point them in the right direction so they can then go and 
um, find out more information for themselves. Um, very often, obviously, you'll have the conversation about, you know, well, is, is it okay in, in oral sex, for example? And then you, you can answer, you know, I, I tend to answer that. Um, speaking to other women, uh, I try and speak to, and not just within the HIV sector, I try and speak to anyone that I come across. Anyone that will listen. Anyone that will listen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and it's, it's a great, you know, sort of conversation or, or when you're having this and there's a, where do you work in the HIV sector? Oh, that's a, and then obviously you'll drop it in because a lot of people think, oh my God, it's still, you know, quite easy to catch and then U equals U becomes part of a message. Okay. So I do, yeah. Brilliant. I mean, one of the, the questions that the um, women's room ladies at Positively UK, hi guys, uh, had for me was how do, what would you recommend is the best way to tell someone that you're living with HIV? Right, so <laughs> <laughs> where do I start? <laughs> the, the, I mean, every woman's got different strategies. Mm -hmm. um, for me personally is I always try, and I've tried, I've tried different you know, sort of ways you wait until you're a little bit into the relationship and that goes a little bit pear shape, they never ring you back. <laughs> but what I found works for me is it's one of the conversations that I will have. Not not, oh hello, by the way, I've got HIV. We'll have the initial conversations and the same line that I will describe the fact that I have children um, and this is where I work and I like shoes. And, and by the way, I also have a long-term health condition. Mm -hmm. um, and then for those that are really interested, they'll ask and I'll say, well, I live, you know, I'm living with HIV, have been for the last 23 years. And the conversation will start from there. Um, one particular strategy that I like that a lady shared with me was that she takes, they go on a date to the cinema and as the film is starting, she said, oh, by the way, I have HIV. <laughs> and she focuses on the film and he's sitting there thinking, what? So, and then that gives him a chance to sort of, you know, it gives a chance for him to... Could she not hand him a leaflet at the same yeah. time, by the way, read this? Well, she's <laughs> But I mean, those, those are all sorts of strategies. Sometimes it's not as easy. So yeah. sometimes I, I, I suggest that, you know, you tease it out, put a taster out there. Just Even just the fact that you say, I work for the HIV, you know, for an HIV organisation brings out a lot of things. You'll get those, go, oh my God, don't, you know. Mm -hmm. And you know straight away, you know what, I'm not going anywhere with this person. Whereas if somebody says, oh, that's really interesting, tell me a bit more, you know you can eventually, you know. But I find if you tell them straight away, then yeah. you can either think, I'm going to invest time in this yeah. one, and no, I'm not going to invest yeah. time. So. Okay, great. And, yeah. and Tom, have you found it? Because I've seen stuff on Twitter that... Um, whereby you've shared some like quite funny sort of like stories about things people have said when you've oh. told them that you're HIV positive. Uh, grinder. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so I've since almost day one, so probably a year into my diagnosis, when I was comfortable with it, I, it's always been on like, the front of my grinder or whatever profile. It says I'm HIV positive. And it, I just find it sort of sorts the men from the boys, as it were. If they're not interested, they won't message me. And if, you know, if I message them and... They're, they're bad about it, you know. It's, it's no love lost, no, one, no one's wasting any time. But you do occasionally get hateful messages. I've, I'd share some of the grinder messages, you know, ones who are going, their first message is, I bet you wish you'd want a rubber now, you slut, and things like that. But nice. I think, I, I, but I don't think it's any different necessarily to the, the hate that a lot of women get on, on things like Tinder and social media. It's just one person that thinks they're more, su um, uh, more superior, you know, a degrading another person for whatever reason. But I always try to come back with it with, with, um, with humour. So, you know, to that person I replied with a picture of an old woman pointing to the globe with a caption, point to where I showed, where I asked you. But, you know, <laughs> you, have to, you have to combat hate with yeah, humour. And yeah. that's the same for anything on social media or Grindr or Tinder. Mm. I know, I know you, you're, 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 you're a fan <laughs> no, of Tinder. It's not about me, it's about you guys. <laughs> <laughs> you share your story. No, yeah, no, nothing. <laughs> just. Just talk about you, talk among yourself. <laughs> but, but, so let, let's move on from Tinder. But um, another really important strategy in HIV prevention is PrEP. And like Jason, would you like to explain to everyone what PrEP is and the work that you do in PrEP? 
Sure. So PrEP is a pill routine that if you don't have HIV, you can start and it can prevent you from contracting HIV if you come into, uh, come into exposure. I think the correct word is exposure with someone with, with HIV. So the work that I've done uh, related to my first porn scene where my partner had HIV and I didn't know what that meant. And then I started PrEP as a consequence to feel sort of more confident mm -hmm. about my work and learning more about the sector. Fantastic. And, and do you talk to um, people about PrEP? Do you like to talk yes, about... it's a bit of a thorny subject at the moment because NHS England aren't commissioning it, so it's part of a trial. Mm. Um, and there are lots more people who would benefit from it than we can give it at the moment, or well, there definitely is that we come across. I'm sure you find the same. Um, but yeah, the people that we've got um, going through the trial, you can either take it daily, so every single day, or if, what we call event-based dosing. So it kind of depends how you're having sex. So if you're having sex randomly all the time, just take it every day. Mm -hmm. If you kind of, you know, have a four weeks off and then go mad at the weekend, you know, there's no point, because all drugs have side effects. So, yeah. you know, it's not without its downsides. Um, but I would say for anybody who feels they need it, so people who need it are high risk, so men who are having sex with men, condomless anal sex, mm -hmm. um, sex workers who aren't using condoms, so kind of a anything that's putting you at high risk, um, a lot of the transgender communities, um, if there are no trial spaces you can get it at this site called I Want Prep Now, which is where we direct people to, um, there is a Mags Portman fund uh, for people who are um, who can't afford it, but you have to, I think you have, do you have to be on benefits to qualify for it? You have to, you have to apply for it. You have to apply, but means yeah, mm. it's means tested. Mm. Um, but again, I think it works out as about £20 a month, mm. you know, to buy. And actually, if you think that you're going to go buy condoms, if you're having that much sex, it's actually um, cost effective. Very, yeah. mm. um, you know, and often people's sex lives changes. So, you know, you might need it for, say, 12 months and then, you know, you meet someone and you become monogamous or whatever. So it's not forever, but it's a great strategy for now. For now, exactly, yeah. if you need it. I uh, certainly uh, agree. Just, I just wanted yeah. to add, um, if you are buying it online, it is important to have your you regular get, yeah. STI checks mm. um, every three months. Of course. And obviously if you develop symptoms, then go to your nearest sexual health clinic. And also we'd always advise that you get your kidneys checked um, yeah. every three months. So if you, if you are taking it, then just come and let your sexual health clinic know and we'll do you, you know, kidney check and your STI check every mm. three months. Um, and also, I mean, in, in terms of black women that are disproportionately a affected by HIV, but I don't think that women really know enough uh, about PrEP. I mean, what's your experience been in terms of getting messages across about PrEP to women, particularly from African communities? Okay, so there's, there's two sides to that. There, there are those of us that are within the HIV community mm -hmm. who tend to know a little bit more about it. It's trickling through. Um, unfortunately, not very many of us have the confidence or, you know, the, the space or whatever it is that we need to have conversations with people outside of the HIV sector. And that's where we, I guess, are falling short of um, being able to provide you know, information on PrEP and all of that kind of thing. Um, so it is a challenge, uh, and I wish there was more that we could do. Um, you know, and, and I'm sure we'll cover this later on, but, you know, have national campaigns, for example, everywhere where they sell condoms or where we go and buy sex toys, have that sort of information um, about PrEP, uh, you know, just keep the conversation going but it is it is quite challenging it's, it's challenging to talk about sex per se so and then go beyond that it's even more challenging and also yeah. if you think if if actually we put more campaigns into everybody getting tested mm. and then everyone was on treatment you, the epidemic would burn out because you'd stop transmissions so you know it's a mm. that I mean, would yeah i i agree um, um, you know, there are lots of other little bits of things, obviously, to take into consideration when you say, I mean, when you talk about PrEP, um, there's also um, making sure that people are informed that it it's, works for HIV. There are still other STIs that need to be, um, you know, checked and all of that kind of, it doesn't protect you against pregnancy. So all of those issues need to be covered as well when we're talking about PrEP. And, and Jason, in, in relation, because I know you run Porn for PrEP. Porn for PrEP. 
Can you tell us about that initiative? So we used adult film as an educational tool to spread information about PrEP in the early days. So I've uh, been on PrEP for about four years now, mm -hmm. and we just demonstrated that PrEP was preventing HIV transmission. Uh, I was on PrEP and my partner had a high viral load. Mm -hmm. At the time they were changing their medication and had a high viral load. Um, and we demonstrated that we, it didn't, mm -hmm. <laughs> didn't, <Yes>. didn't, <laughs> didn't, <laughs> didn't contract <laughs> HIV. Like, so it was sort of the idea of people understand things clinically sometimes, but it's when they see something mm -hmm. that sometimes they learn in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, but when it, com when it comes in particular with, with women um, in sex work, we find sometimes when it comes to spreading information about PrEP, you really do have to look at other societal changes, like mm -hmm. the decriminalization of sex work, Yes. to get the information to a community. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And is there a strike coming up to oh. highlight that? <laughs> on the 8th of March, yes. uh, <laughs> so on International Women's Day, yes. uh, 8th of March at 5 p.m., there's going to be sex workers marching in the streets from Soho Square. And part of that is about whether you're from a strip club or uh, from a brothel or an independent worker or a phone sector, all of these different sectors, there's information that people have rights to know, mm -hmm. and there's human rights that we should be deserving. And so it's about talking about some of that. Okay, fantastic. And, and also, in, I mean, in relation to women, um, I've had people ask me, um, you know, as women get older, living with HIV, and, um, how, and going through their menopause, have you... The yeah, that's what, I, I'm not, I'm not like hot or anything <laughs> here. We were menopausal. There's, there's three things we don't talk enough about. Yeah. Sex, yeah. death, and menopause. Yes. <laughs> and death and menopause are things that we're definitely going to have, even if we're not having the BS mm -hmm. thing enough. Yeah, um, so, so in, as a woman. In, yes. <laughs> yeah, so, sorry, boys. <laughs> <laughs> so um, in, in relation to women living with HIV who are going through the menopause, what advice would you give in, in relation to sex? Because I've heard of women having issues in terms of like dry vaginas and, and sex being painful. Yeah, yeah, so... Um, yeah, lots of things come with the menopause, so aching joints and getting fat and hot flushes and vaginal dryness, it just sounds great, Yay. I can't <laughs> wait. Um, and yeah, it's often a time when your libido can diminish um, or sex becomes painful, as you say, so the oestrogen that you produce when you're ovulating keeps your vagina moist and supple. Um, when that decreases, you can develop sort of thinning of the vagina, it can be very sore. Um, so lubrication can really help. Um, HRT is really good if you can take it. It does increase your risk of breast cancer, but it's protective um, for your heart and your bones and lots of other things. Um, but even if you can't take topical, uh, if you can't take um, systemic HRT, so as a tablet or a gel form, you can use topical HRT for the vagina. So it will oestrogenize your vagina, which can help a lot. Okay. And I don't think people, so for my issue is, I don't think as clinicians in HIV clinic, we're necessarily asking people that thing. You know, when did you last have sex? Tick. We're not saying, are you enjoying your sex? Or why aren't you having yeah. sex or whatever? And I think we could be better. Um, and I think patients need to be advocates for their own bodies and say, well, you know, because we can change the antiretroviral medication if they're going to interact. You know, we do that regularly now with contraceptive options, mm. so it should be the same with HRT in my book anyway. Okay, fantastic. And I'm not saying anything about you and the menopause, not <laughs> making no I'm suggestions. I'm not there yet. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Yeah. But what would you say about, you know, for, for women getting older, living with HIV, who still want to have a pleasurable sex life? Enjoy it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I agree, there's, there's lots of conversations that we need to have, particularly al around menopause. Um, shout out to the Prime study, for example, that has lots well, of, um, you know, information and has done a lot of research around, you know, the, the menopause and, and things like that. And, and one of the things that they, they recommend is, you know, if you're going through all of these things, HRT is pretty good. So, you know, um, okay. that will be a good place to start. Fantastic. I think mm. we've got a question from Virginia in the... Yeah. Some studies that say gentle exercise help also to go through the symptoms of menopause and they make it less strong. And I have been through two menopause and one induced by chemotherapy and another one natural, and the natural was not so bad. 
because I was I think because I was able to do some exercise and but all the yeah, other symptoms yeah. I have suffered. Yeah. Yeah. In thank this you. case, sex exercise. <laughs> sex exercise. Um, so, uh, James, have we got any questions from the Facebook audience for uh, our yes, panel? Yes, we do. Uh, we've got one question from uh, Christian Shamu, um, who says, great panel. <laughs> but he asks, <laughs> apart from legal considerations for non-disclosure um, of HIV, how does the panel um, feel about mandatory disclosure of HIV in the uh, era of uh, U equals U, two sexual partners? Ooh. That's a tough one. It's, a tough it's one. not been tested in law yet, as in, you know, someone sort of brought a case of non disclosure. This is your bag, really, Matt. Mm. You love it this is my question. Bag that keeps I'll pass that, that back to you. It makes people uneasy because I think as clinicians, before U equals U was embraced, it was very easy as a clinician to say we would recommend legally to disclose your HIV status because of the the small, and we used to use all these sort of phrases like there's a low risk or small risk that we weren't quantifying, even if you were on treatment. I think U equals U has addressed the transmission laws. Transmission laws don't apply if you are suppressed on antiretroviral therapy. But there are other laws as well. and. So one of my things is the law about around consent, conditional consent. And there was an, a, a case with an awful outcome. Um, it, was, it, was, it was to do with a transgender relationship where one of the, the partners didn't realize that they were seeing someone who was transgendered and they were successful in the prosecution of this non-disclosure of their, their, their gender identity. And there's a concern that someone may use apply the same principles to someone who didn't disclose that they had HIV. So basically they're saying, I wouldn't have had sex with you had I known you'd had HIV. And that it might become problematic if someone is not ready to disclose their status. They know they're not going to transmit the virus, but don't say anything about it. They have sex, the HIV negative person finds out and says, well, that's a breach of consent. And it's just a case of there's no legal framework that says it's okay. So we kind of, it's a great area. Sorry, can I just butt in? So another, I love butting in. Um, I hate that word disclose. I was brought up by a patient who said, because we were talking, you know, I used to say, we used to say, you know, ask your patient if you disclose. It's not a criminal, you know, conviction that you're disclosing. It should be tell or share. share. Um, so I think we, and I think as medics, you know, pull us up if we do say that word, just slap us around the face and tell us off because I think it, it doesn't help. It makes it sound like something dreadful that you've got to disclose. One of our um, colleagues, Angelina, um, says uh, there's no good dis words. Dissonance, uh, disgust, yeah, like that, disclosure. Yeah. The only good dis word is disco. And it doesn't really apply here. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Distribute is quite yeah. a nice word. I think it is also it really spread? highlights the fact like that spread. people have such a level of placing a false sense of security and people will tell me what their status is. I think this really highlights the fact that they, they think that being told is something that's a safety measure when actually people are largely contracting HIV from someone who doesn't who know. Does, yeah. So there's no security there. Yeah. We're looking at this in the porn industry and trying to set up stru uh, structures that enable performers living with HIV where they don't have to disclose because someone else has said, I'm happy in this situation. Mm. That's what I've done. So I perform as someone who's living with HIV or I perform as someone who isn't. I don't necessarily need to know what they are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'd argue that if you're going to get into bed with someone, you're taking that risk, yeah. you know, with everyone. It shouldn't, the, the owner shouldn't be on, the, the person living with HIV, it should be on both of them getting into bed and having a... People should take ownership of their own sexuality. They should, they yeah. rely on yeah. other people. Yeah. I, I, I tend to, I mean, I agree. That a lot of the time people always expect somebody else to take responsibility mm. for their own um, mm. choices. Um, you know, and I think, well, that's, that's a bit unreasonable. If you've chosen to then go this far with this person, ideally you should be taking responsibility for whatever else happens yeah. there. Unless, of course, there's, you know... Um, no consent or whatever the case may be. But Absolutely, and I, I think we need to be mindful that we have an international audience, so mm -hmm. you know, you, you need to abide whatever the law is in, in the country, country in which you're watching, mm -hmm. even within uh, 
the UK, um, the law is different in, in England yeah. than it is in relation to, to Scotland. Yeah. My friends at the National AIDS Trust have lots of information about that, so I, I would suggest if you're in the UK, yeah. check out NAT for information yeah. with regards to that. Difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, send no more of those. Yeah, Thanks. geez. Uh, Thanks. It's a difficult answer, yeah. because there it is none. Yeah, there isn't really a good answer. Um, uh, do we have any questions from the audience or Twitter? The <laughs> in relation to nothing from the audience in relation to that <laughs> issues there. I mean, one thing that someone asked me as well uh, related to um, chemsex. Is that uh, an issue that you're finding with your patients living with HIV? I think it's not an, an issue per se. It may be for some people and it may be well managed for others. I guess I would use the equivalent of alcohol consumption. Some people will have a few drinks and then that's it and then they'll go about their business. From a medical perspective, I'm not so concerned about them yes i will tell them about potential risks especially if they're injecting i'll talk about risks of hepatitis c etc and to to get that regularly checked but if it's under control from their perspective and they're functioning in society as they want to be then i've got no issue but certainly there's a there is a a, a slight increase in the trend of of that loss of control and that's when i think chemsex can be problematic when it does start to to creep into everyday life where you know it's going from a one day thing to a three four day thing and they're missing time off work and that's when i become more concerned mm -hmm. and that's from a from a more of a mental health perspective mm -hmm. i would say this situation uh, this this point about chemsex also connects to the previous point we said about uh hiv in law i would say we're not going to beat HIV if we don't look at things like the decriminalization of drugs and the success that that's had in Portugal at stopping uh, the opioid epidemic, the, uh, the decriminalization of sex work, and we're removing the HIV laws. We really have to talk about these things because we're not going to get marginalized communities involved with our outreach unless mm -hmm. we do make these steps. Mm -hmm. So that's what I would say when it comes to chemsex. We need to be decriminalizing drugs and welcoming people into support and saying you can talk about these things with people. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I just want a quick question um, I saw on Twitter earlier actually was to the two doctors. Um, what are the things that a newly diagnosed person like myself um, eight years ago could do to further look after themselves? So there, um, um, so well obviously we've got our HIV treatment, but there are vaccinations, are there other supplements we could be taking? What can we best do to protect ourselves and look after ourselves? So the HPV vaccine is a fairly new um, vaccine for many of sex with men. So any many of sex with men under the age of 45 should be coming to their sexual health clinic for uh, HPV, human papillomavirus, um, which is the virus that causes, uh, a lot of women will have heard of it with regards to the smear test, but it can cause anal cancers, throat cancers, etc. So men need to be coming to access that. And then we vaccinate against hepatitis B and hepatitis A as well. Mm -hmm. and it's the same. In fact, actually, it's recommended by our national guidelines for, for women to also have an HPV vaccine. Unfortunately, in England anyway, it's not commissioned. And so I find myself in a very awkward position where I'm explaining you should have this, but we can't give it. And so there's a still a lot of, of changes that need to happen uh, from a governmental level, laws. We know legal laws take ages to, to come into play, historically anyway society always shifts a hell of a lot slower than science. And I think that's sort of what we're, we're dealing with with regards to HIV and everything else, because it's a relatively new condition, sort of the, the, the early to mid eighties is when we really started to become aware of it. So I think we've got a, qu uh, a question from Facebook and then a question from, from charity. <laughs> We have uh, one question um, from uh, Becky, um, who asks, um, for the eight people living with HIV on the panel, um, what are your views of HIV-only um, dating websites? Um, because she feels that they can uh, bring and promote shame and stigma. Uh, I've not used one, but um, I have seen them. 
Um, one of our friends, Angelina, has got many stories about them, none of them good. Um, <laughs> the thing is, I look at them, and because I've worked in tech, I look behind, and you find they're never owned by people living with HIV. They're owned by a giant company like DatingWarehouse.com that own dating brands for any kind of situation. And you'd, I'd have questions about how secure my data was around my HIV, you know, the people I know, my sex, and so it's, so on, on the whole sort of security side, I wouldn't be happy with it. And it just feels weird as, as a, you're, you're limiting, limiting yourself. yourself yeah, and you're self-stigmatizing. Self it's because, self-stigmatizing. Yeah. It's, and it's reducing your dating pool. There are, yeah. The majority of the population do not have HIV. And that's a whole lot of ass you're, you're missing out on if you're, if you're only <laughs> focusing on, the, on the, the, mini, the tiny subset of the, the tiny subset of the tiny subset that are using that website. I mean, I was going to say it's a very small pool. <laughs> <laughs> and the, and the, you get and a few back again. Even yeah. when you finish <laughs> and the chances of you, I mean, it's, it's, it's challenging to, to find someone to date anyway. And then if you narrow it down to this few people. Um, and why should you? Yeah, and that's, about, that's the you know, point. Of health condition. Exactly. Well, it's not even that. It's, it's like saying it's I'm only going to date someone else with diabetes yeah. or, uh, yeah. you know, a dodgy thyroid. And, and that's... <laughs> oh, I can't... I that, mean, that it's ridiculous. There's probably a website for that. Point. Well, probably. There is one for people who have the herpes virus, yeah. which, again, that, you know, is ridiculous. Yeah, when you take that off the table, is there anything else we have in common? Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> so, you know, for me, um, I think it was a decision I made very long time ago that, no, I'm not going to be doing that. Um, and I agree, it does... It does sort of the self-stigma. It does... It does perpetuates the stigma and the, and the discrimination. Um, when you're out there, oh, I'm doing two things really, doing good, I'm telling you about the HIV and you know spreading the word, but also um, emphasizing the fact that it's a long-term health condition. Um, that said, you know, there are a lot of people that think, yes, that's the only thing, that's the only place I can go to. Mm. It takes a lot of uh, confidence to be able to. I always say, you know, when you talk about your HIV, you talk about it from a position of power mm -hmm. because then that enables you to be able to own it. Nobody else can go and talk about it. And then you, you're in a better position to negotiate who you want to sleep with or not. I think that takes time, doesn't it? It, it does. It takes a lot of self-awareness yeah. and self-love, really, and yeah. self-care. And I think, you know, when you first get that diagnosis, most it's people's reaction is not... It's not a good reaction. Yeah. So you go through a grief process, don't you? And, you know, grieve oh. the loss of what you thought you were yeah. and whatever and have to deal with your own internal stigma about the condition if you'd heard of it before. Yeah. Um, so maybe it's good for getting out there on the dating scene again. I don't know. For some situations, we probably shouldn't. Uh, I think it starts off well-meaning. Yeah. And it comes from a good place. Yeah. Um, I think it can be quite segregating, though, as well, mm. because people may feel they've created this for me, this is the only space that I can walk in. Mm. And so, I mean, for some people, like you're saying, if they've, they've just been diagnosed and they can't talk to anyone, they might want to gravitate to people who've had that shared experience. And that's where I think the website probably comes yeah. from a good place. There are also healthier places perhaps to do that though. So uh, the GMFA POS pub crawl for, for gay men living with HIV um, in London. Fun. It is a lot of fun. And, um, there's the Catwalk for Power, there's um, events for people up and down in the UK of HIV that don't necessarily fixate on sex and dating. I think that's a really good place to start and yeah. um, just go up to somebody who you know who's got HIV, but you can practice telling them, hi, my name's Tom, I've had HIV for eight years. And it's, mm. it's just a, a way of doing that you know you're not going to get rejected, but you still have to make the words come out of your mouth. Okay, brilliant. I think we've got a question from the audience. Yes, um, uh, Dennis Anyango from Africa Advocacy Foundation. Um, this is for uh, Naomi and Matthew. Uh, given the fact that you've mentioned that um, you know the medical professional clinicians, a number of them have been late uh, coming on board with regards to equals to you. Um, what do you think that uh, you know the clinicians actually need to do to compensate for uh, that slowness? Uh, and again, just to understand how uh, you navigate some of those very complex issues as clinicians when you're talking to somebody who probably has language barriers or is experiencing a lot of complex issues mm -hmm. and they need their confidence you know around sex oh, and, yeah. and, and relationships mm -hmm. how how do you do it how do you get people to be confident to go out there and overcome the stigma around <laughs> hiv and date again so i think well so First of all, the U equals U is education. It's always education. So I just think the more we could, things like this, 
the sex clinic coming out soon, <laughs> series two. We so? talk about mm, it's soon on E4, a couple of weeks. Oh, yeah, yeah funny enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, we talk about you cause you um, with a couple of patients who are HIV positive. So things like that that reach the general public, I think, are really important because the problem is you Twitter around the same sort of group. So education general public, but also for GPs and general physicians and everything else, so grand rounds and whatever. And I think, you know, we have to be advocates of this and keep banging that drum, which I don't get invited to barbecues anymore because I am so dull. I'm like, vaginas, vaginas, vulvas, you equals you. They're like, oh God, menstrual cups, period pads. Anyway, that's, a, that's another, invite me back. Um, but uh, what was I saying? Yeah, and I, so for me, I think it's that clinician-patient relationship. So, you know, definitely in Rotherham, we try to see the same person again and again. So you don't have to go through the same conversations, you know, and you build up the relationship. And if you need to be seen every week, we see you every week. Um, some people like coming back because it makes them feel more confident. Other people, you know, want to be seen as little as possible. So it's about building that confidence. And through time, and I think, you know, your relationship with a patient um, can be very um, cathartic, is that the right word? You know, for, um, healing in itself. Mm. Because we are, hopefully, completely non judgmental. And at the end of the day, we're all having sex. So, you know, the fact that we're judging someone on having a sexually transmitted infection, um, you know, it, it's luck of the draw. It, it sort of, you know, it drives me a bit crazy that we are so funny about. Yeah. Thanks. 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 That's why I think I think the porn industry is doing some great work talking about this activism because they're already painted with this brush of sex. Mm. So they're already going to be talking about it. They're already going to be stigmatised as this is a sexual person. And when they, as they have, have been talking about U equals U and PrEP, then it accesses culture in multiple different ways. And you do see a general shift in culture, which might make it more comfortable for people uh, after, after diagnosis, because they're realizing that generally there's more information out there. Mm -hmm. Things like PrEP, things like U equals U, is getting culture shifting and asking even the more nuanced yeah. questions. And I definitely think we're, we're getting there. We've got a long way to go. But if you look back to, you know, the the gay revolutions back in the 1970s, you know, I mean, it was illegal to have anal sex. So, you know, we're actually moving on as a society. It's just frustratingly slow, I think, for people who are stuck in the middle of it, but... It's slow and, I mean, I have a lot of patients, I've had a good portion of patients who I tell you equals you to, and they're like, oh, we knew this since the 90s. Um, it's just the science wasn't really there. And this is, I think, the reason why a lot of clinicians were very slow on the uptake. And then if you read, the data and get down to the fine details. There's these statistical parameters around it that they put around everything, which is why people were very slow to say that there's zero risk, I think. It's very difficult to prove a, prove a negative, and yeah. that's what we were trying to prove. So when you put a hypothesis, you always say, you know, there is a risk of transmission. You have to have so many non-transmissions to prove a negative. That's why it's taken so long as medics and as the medical fraternity, I think, to get on board. So I think education is the start in terms of your question about sort of the confidence thing. But I think there's more to it than just you equals you. Some mm. of the things, you know, we as clinicians and you as a person can manage. But I think the bigger issue is society and stigma. And it takes generations to kind of minimise and diminish that stigma. And we, we're getting there. But it's like you were saying, um, it's just frustratingly slow. On your point about um, where English might not be someone's first language, uh, the Prevention Access Campaign who came up with the U equals U message, if you go on their website, there's a world map and you can zoom in on specific countries and it'll give you links to organisations who have signed up to the U equals U consensus statement, which means they've got information about U equals U on their website, which will be in their local language, which is a really useful oh, tool. Thank you. Thank you. We've got a question from the audience, from Jose. Yes, hi. Uh, yeah, I think my, my main question is we've been talking about HIV as a sort of important matter for for having positive or negative sex, sex and relationships. And it would be great to hear about other things and other important matters or issues or whatever you want to call them that might have an impact on both sex and relationship. And this could be, I don't know, things like body image and racism and sexism and 
as many others as you mm. want to talk about, but it would be great to hear your opinions on these other things that might affect sex and relationships. Mm. Can I take that one? Yeah. <laughs> 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 I'm excited about that one because uh, I think you touched on something really important, the fact that society is so used to talking in binaries. This person is positive, this person's negative. We had to change the terminology of someone being positive to people living with HIV, as it should be, respecting about people. But I think we're getting to a place where we need people to understand uh, maybe even someone being negative is possibly not great terminology in itself because the person is an HIV negative test result holder, but what test did they have? When did they have their test? And I mean, what was the window period relating to which test they had? So this whole idea of this person being negative and that being an image of safe somehow needs to be eroded and actually to the point where people have more nuanced conversations. And I would say that's about removing the binaries and saying, okay, getting having more, more nuanced conversations will help them appreciate people who are, uh, who are undetectable, will help uh, understand why condoms can be used or PrEP can be used. I think it's a cultural shift. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think in the gay community, there's also a lot of, and, and in the porn industry, there's so much uh, body image issues. Uh, I think a lot of us, since as early as I can remember being gay, you know, Attitude Magazine, Gay Times and all the, the stuff online, so I'm not smooth, six-pack, massive arms, so I seem to feel like I have less value in the gay community. And that, that still holds true today, you know, I'm not uh, a muscled Adonis, but... Oh, you are. Uh, I'm, 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 too, I'm too fat to be a... T I'm too old to be a twink. I'm not hairy enough to be a bear or a cub. I'm like just some sort of thing in the middle. But there is so much body image, uh, like crisis in the gay community, and I think a lot of people go from one extreme to the other to either not caring about themselves so much they don't engage in exercise and, and eating well enough after looking at the body or they go to the other end of the scale where they put a lot of their their self-worth into going to the gym and maintaining that body image and I think that's something that as a community we're struggling with and I think that impacts think on dating crisis. and sex. I think it's crisis for the world really yeah. mm. but I feel there's a lot of positivity out there now on social mm. media of kind of you know body positivity um, um, on Instagram or whatever and the you know. Destroyers. What? The cock destroyers <laughs> on Twitter. They t two two the women two work porn in porn, and they are oh. amazing, and they do the most sexy and hilarious videos, and it's, it's just full of positivity and body positivity oh, and affirmation. Yeah. They are great. We love them. Really, destroyers. really good. Yeah, but I think you know people are out there now going. Actually, I've got cellulite. I've got a big bum. Well, who cares? And uh, you know, so there's a. I think there's a big movement that's growing to sort of say, actually, I'm good because we're on this earth for a short time why we spend every day worrying about, you know, whether you're an inch fatter than you should be, um, you know, seems ridiculous because, you know, you're not going to enjoy yourself. You're not going to enjoy the sex that you want to have if you're constantly thinking about your big bum or saggy boobs or whatever it is that, you know, yeah, both of those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, I'm not wearing, like, super tight Spanx <laughs> at all now, yeah. <laughs> yes, everyone, I... <laughs> I did today put my spanks on back to front. <laughs> I thought it really can't be this uncomfortable. <laughs> but yeah, I'm okay. But you know, we all want to look good, don't we? And we all want to feel happy. So there's a balance between also being healthy. Mm. So I would say it's more about, not about what you look like, it's what's going on inside. So, you know, eat well. I am a doctor after all. You know, eat well, <laughs> don't smoke, don't drink too much, don't drink, well, you know, but, yes. but try and accept that, you know, your frame will be very different to somebody else's and, you know, try to just be kind to yourself. Absolutely, that's a really great message. And also, I, I have to mention um, Matthew Hodson. Hi, Matthew, the, the chief executive of NAM. I don't know if any of you have seen his yeah. gym selfies. Yeah. <laughs> Not really boys them. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I know that, that Matthew uh, really um, talks about the fact that actually, you know, he may be living with HIV and he may be 52, 50, yes. 52, but actually, you know, he's like... He looks incredible. He, he yeah, he is like... He's, he's not surviving, he's thriving. He uh, is right. indeed. He's doing a marathon. He yeah. is actually running a marathon this year for NAM. So everyone, sponsor Matthew, because ultimately... It, 
I, yeah, I need work, and Nam feeds my kids as well. So yeah, well, those are going to be like your shoes. Yeah, and yeah, like, <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 shoes. yeah. Oh, they're <laughs> no, no, really, like Nam isn't anything to do with Louboutin. No, probably not the message that we're we're giving. But yeah, but um, we should it, say though that now you know there's evidence that people living with HIV are actually li living longer than the mm, general population yeah. because they're constantly monitored, and a lot of men don't go to healthcare naturally so they're having their blood pressure checked and their cholesterol and all the rest yes. of it so you know the the outlook for longevity of life and health is really positive uh, and good yeah. absolutely do we have another any more questions from the physical audience uh, okay yes <laughs> okay this this question is for anyone on the panel it's um um, about uh, sex cam, what? Cancer. Cam sex. <laughs> yeah. You see, well, this know. this shows how much I don't know about uh, cam. What? Cam no, <laughs> <laughs> <Like chemical> sex. <laughs> Whatever it is. Okay. What is uh, cam sex, and what does it involve? So who's going to answer that? <laughs> I, I I'll, I'll just like to point. I think there's um. Who's the one that leads usually on, on a lot of the chemsex videos? David Stewart. Yes, so he's got a very good website or little film that he's actually shown, which helped me understand a lot more about chemsex. So that might be, a, you know, a place to start. But um, yeah, over yeah, to so you. He coined the phrase, didn't he? Yes. Chemsex. Um, it's it is very nuanced. It's not just any drugs. It's drugs such as GHB, GBL, uh, methadrone, and crystal meth or methamphetamines um, and it's sort of the sexualized use of those drugs um, whether they're taken through I think the medical term is insufflation which is snorting um, orally as a drink or injecting okay well thank you I noticed that we've got one more minute oh, so wow. that was quick. Really final quick. question to all of you in less than 10 words, what is your hope for HIV and sex for the future? Tom? Sex without stigma. Oh, that was mine. <laughs> that was all our lives. Um, a cure in my lifetime, it'd be nice. Or, you know, actually, I, I just, if everyone could get tested, the epidemic would end. Mm -hmm. Acceptance for all. Wonderful. I would go for DASP. So decriminalisation as prevention. Decriminalisation of HIV, sex work, drugs. Oh, you've pictures all there. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> Rubbish. Um, for me, I think uh, knowledge is liberation because it just allows you to be free. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for our studio audience. Thank you for the live audience. Thank you to Compare the Cloud, Disruptive Live Staff. You've all been incredible. And for more information, go to aidsmap.com. Thank you. <laughs>